thank you so much. Um, Alabama is one of the most important places in the nation when it comes to historic events, civil rights, voter registration. And when we think of the important names associated with the events, particularly Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we remember today, I thank you for allowing me to bring another person's story to light during this special year of commemoration. Some of the photographs you see are reproduced in their entirety and have small print that you're not expected to read on the screen. This is the story of Jonathan Myrick Daniels, a 26-year-old Episcopal seminarian from New Hampshire who felt compelled to join the Civil Rights March from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. He remained in Selma to help with voter registration after the other outsiders had returned home. Jonathan's writings, letters, newspaper articles, and interviews with those who knew him reveal a story of a life, ministry, and an absurd death that's part of the fabric of our history. Jonathan was born March 20th, 1939 in Keene, New Hampshire to Dr. Philip and Constance Daniels. Dr. Daniels helped found the Keene Medical Clinic. Mrs. Daniels was a homemaker and a teacher of French. The family was active in the Congregational Church. Jonathan had one sibling, a sister named Emily. Here's the family at Christmas several years later. John sang in the choir, played musical instruments, and was an avid reader. When Dr. Daniels died of renal failure in 1957, John began thinking of following in his father's footsteps and becoming a physician. As a teenager, John began attending St. James Episcopal Church in Keene, New Hampshire. He was drawn by the rituals, the ceremony, and the sacred music. He decided to become an Episcopalian. It was the first of many faith decisions he would make. After high school, he entered Virginia Military Institute and graduated valedictorian of the class of 1961. He entered Harvard to pursue graduate studies in English. However, still thinking he might become a physician, he left Harvard, returned home, and worked in a hospital for a while. But this didn't satisfy him either. He admits to struggling with his faith, even losing it at times. But he wrote, the one who calls you will not let you go unless you freely choose. On Easter Sunday in 1962, while singing in the choir at the Church of the Advent in Keene, John experienced a spiritual awakening. He felt called to serve as a minister. He entered St. James Episcopal Theological Seminary near Boston, and at that time began working in an urban ministry in Providence, Rhode Island, that had a predominantly black population. It was his first experience with poor black people. He began to understand race relations, urban society, and the church's urban role. The experience had a profound effect upon him and he wrote, I am bitterly opposed to racial prejudice. I cannot tolerate the proximity of conspicuous waste and undernourished children. John told his mother, well, it looks like I'll become a slum priest. In October of 1963, he joined the NAACP, an unconventional action by a privileged white man from the North. But John was beginning to find his bearings. Now, while John was in seminary, he was aware of the deep divisions in the nation over civil rights and the war brewing in Vietnam. He, like many of us, watched nightly news programs 
with horrifying photos of racial violence, war violence, and maltreatment of humans at home and across the globe. He was plagued by social injustices, and he prayed about what to do. He wrote his mother that he wanted to live his faith, but he was not sure how. Meanwhile, in Birmingham, Alabama, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama, the Right Reverend Charles Carpenter, often met with civil rights leaders and clergy at Carpenter House, the headquarters of the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. Bishop Carpenter tried to convince people to let the courts handle civil rights issues rather than taking violence into the streets. Then there was the looming divisive question of what the churches were going to do about integration. For those of you who may not have been aware of life in the Deep South at the time, segregation was entrenched in the culture by law. Here's an example. There were white-only entrances to many businesses and public facilities. Blacks continued to have difficulty registering to vote. Anyone who tried to register had to have a fellow voter sign for them. They had to pass a poll tax and had to pass a literacy test. In Alabama, there was a literacy test with 66 questions. So I'm going to test your knowledge here. Question. Appropriation of money for the armed services can only be for a period limited to? Okay. Question. The Constitution limits the size of the District of Columbia to? You define the size. Question. If it were proposed to join Alabama and Mississippi to form one state, what groups would have to vote approval in order for this to be done? Okay, I don't want to frustrate you too badly, so uh, I'll put the answers in. Believe me, I did not pass this test when I took it. <laughs> uh, I have a copy for display up here, uh, which is available after the presentation. On July 2, 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act and finally there was legislation to outlaw major forms of discrimination and to stop unequal application of voter registration requirements. Even so, violence grew in the South as schools and restaurants and hotels integrated. And in Alabama, blacks continued to be blocked from registering to vote. Many of the blacks that were active in the voter rights movement were evicted from houses they rented from whites. They were fired from their jobs. With no housing to go to, they camped out in tent cities. One of these was in the Whitehall area. The Lowndes County Interpretive Center is located there now. There was no running water or latrines in these tent cities. It was indeed primitive camping. And yet after a while, some of the tents had electricity, as you can see from the uh, upper picture. And these tents were in use about two years. By December of 64, Jonathan had been in seminary for two years. That same month, Dr. Martin Luther King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. King saw that some goals had been accomplished in Birmingham, Alabama, so he turned his focus on the Black Belt, Selma, Fort Deposit, and Lowndes County. Dr. King went to Selma to help organize voter registration and during a protest, he was arrested and jailed in Selma on February the 2nd, 1965. Now Jonathan and his fellow seminarians were well aware of this growing unrest and these happenings, but still did not know how to respond. 
While in Selma, Dr. King wrote a letter that appeared in the New York Times. Here's an excerpt. Dear friends, when the King of Norway participated in awarding the Nobel Peace Prize to me, he surely did not think that in less than 60 days I would be in jail. He and almost all world opinion will be shocked because they are little aware of the unfinished business in the South. This is Selma, Alabama. There are more Negroes in jail with me than there are on the voting roads. King issued an urgent call for clergy and men of goodwill to join him on a march from Selma to Montgomery to protest the voting disparities. Part of his strategy was to see if the white power would turn on white clergy and marchers. On March 7th, the marchers started out in Selma. Governor Wallace had banned the march, so the peaceful protesters were confronted by armed state troopers as they tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Scenes of Bloody Sunday in Selma flooded television sets across the nation. People watched in disbelief as citizens were brutalized. Back in Boston at the seminary, Jonathan and fellow seminarian Judith Upham were glued to television coverage of Bloody Sunday. And on March 10th, they heard Dr. King's message, come to Alabama. So John and Judith drove south to join fellow clergy in Selma. Another clergy that responded was Father Richard Morris Rowe, a Roman Catholic priest from Chicago. Several days later, on March 16th, Judge Frank Johnson ruled that marchers had a First Amendment right to march. President Johnson activated the National Guard, and with this protection, the marchers set out again, March 21st of 65. John Daniels and Judith Upham provided transportation and security along the route that took four days to travel from Selma to Montgomery. After this march, most of the ministers and the other interested people returned to their homes and their jobs in the North and in other states. John and Judith remained in Selma, sponsored by the Episcopal Society for Cultural and Racial Unity, known as ESCREW. They taught children and adults to read, helped with voter registration, and helped teens apply to college. They tried to integrate St. Paul's Episcopal Church, but they were denied communion. Now, Episcopal Church canon law required persons to be admitted to Episcopal churches without regard to color. When Reverend Matthews failed to offer Holy Communion to fellow ordained priests, to John and Judith and their black friends, people from around the country sent scathing letters. I found quite a few of these in the uh, Episcopal archives in Birmingham. There's interesting stories in there. An agreement was reached whereby ushers would seat John and his friends at the back of the church. And on Easter, they could take communion last. This incident led S. Screw to issue a statement that said in part, a new form of segregation is emerging in the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. John and Judith appealed to the Episcopal Bishop, the Right Reverend Charles Carpenter. He came to Selma to try to smooth things over. He pleaded with the parties to go slowly, work together, work with the courts. But he too was in a precarious position. The bishop's reality was also full of violence. His friend, Reverend Shuttlesworth's home, had been bombed several years before. Shuttlesworth's family had been attacked 
when he tried to enroll his children in an all-white high school in Birmingham and the 16th Street Baptist Church where four little children were killed was just a couple of blocks away. Yes, Bishop Carpenter was very well aware of the dangers that he, his family, and the church community could suffer if he took a more proactive approach. Meanwhile, John and Judith lived with various families in the Carver Homes housing project in Selma. Housing authorities threatened the families with eviction if they took in the outsiders. But the West family with their ten children took in John and Judith anyway. Conditions were cramped and hot, and John wrote home that food was sometimes scarce. These, uh, this housing project is still in Selma today, and uh, some of it has been redone and is, is occupied. I think there's a movement on to try to get uh, the West family's unit perhaps preserved historically. Mrs. Alice West worked in one of the voter registration schools where blacks were taught to take the literacy test. Some had to first learn how to read. So you'll have some perspective of the area. This map shows the part of the Black Belt that Martin Luther King was focusing on. Selma, Montgomery, Hainville, and Fort Deposit. By late July, Judith had decided to return to Cambridge to continue her seminary studies. John's mother, Connie, begged John to return home as well. She and John's friend sent passionate pleas for him to come home. But his resolve was unshaken. He said, The faith with which I went to Selma has not changed. It has grown. I lost fear when I began to know that in the only sense that really matters, I'm already dead. My life is hid with Christ in God. The main gathering spot for protest in the Black Belt was Brown Chapel in Selma. You can visit this beautiful church today in Dallas County. In August of 65, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. Though blacks could vote, there was much more to be done in Lowndes County. 80% of the county residents were black, but no black had ever voted. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, known as SNCC, from Tuskegee sent workers to help with voter registration. Two of these workers were Ruby Sales, daughter of a military man, and her friend, Joyce Bailey. The group organized a protest in Fort Deposit on a hot Saturday, August 14, 1965. John Daniels, Father Morris Rowe were in the group, along with their leader, Stokely Carmichael. Stokely's plan was to register blacks to vote and petition the white stores there and the restaurant owners in Fort Deposit to allow blacks to enter the front door. They made protest signs such as these. The protesters gathered at a church in Fort Deposit and walked downtown. In the center of town, representatives from Life Magazine and others had gathered. An angry mob of a hundred whites met the protesters with guns and ball bats. In a minor skirmish, Police arrested Jonathan, Father Morris Rowe, Ruby Sales, Joyce Bailey, and about a dozen others. The protesters were loaded onto a garbage truck. It was the largest vehicle available to take them from Fort Deposit to the jail in Hainville, the county seat of Lowndes County. Here, John and the group arrive at the jail. By early afternoon, they were locked into small cells. 
Father Francis Walter, an Episcopal priest in Selma, came with bail money for John. Since there was not enough for the whole group, John declined to be released. Father Walter left to raise more money. Meanwhile, in Fort Deposit, county officials learned that the group was trying to get their case heard in federal court. I went in this jail not long ago and nothing much has changed. The group spent six nights in crowded cells. They did not want a slap on the wrist from a local judge and then to be released. They wanted to be charged with a civil rights violation so they would have notoriety for their cause. John wrote a letter to his mother saying, I'm in jail and I won't be home for your birthday, August the 20th. While John made light of his situation, Father Marsro described their plight in his diary. He said, an inner call led me to Selma and Lowndes County. After 100 hours of bondage, midst much noise and hell raising, the clatter of Coke bottles and pop cans, the hitting of walls, stomping of feet, caught up in reading Frederick Douglass's Up From Slavery in a Dark Cell, eight men, six from Fort Deposit, a black man's hellhole, Jimmy Rogers from Harlem, myself from Chicago Southside. We await our bail money. We want our freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. On Friday morning, August 20th, Tom Coleman, part-time deputy, sat outside on the Lowndes County Courthouse lawn with friends and played dominoes and checkers. He heard that the group would be freed that day, so he went across the lawn and entered Mrs. Virginia Varner's The Cash Store. He stepped inside and told her to put up the closed sign. He said, when the protesters are released, it's just no telling what crimes those hoodlums might commit. That same morning, John and Father Marshrow ate breakfast in jail, probably a bologna sandwich, which was the fare most days. They wondered what the day would bring. At noon, a trustee brought them a piece of paper to sign and said, you're free to go. No explanation or preparation or notice, just go. After a week of being inside grimy, sweltering conditions, the group was released. Father Morris Rowe, John, Joyce, and Ruby ran to greet each other outside. They hugged. How are you? Are you okay? Who even knows we're free? Look, there's a store, the cash store. Let's go get a Coca-Cola. The four grabbed hands and walked to the store, talking along the way. John took Ruby's hand and walked in front, followed by Father Morris Rowe and Joyce. Ruby walked to the door of the cash store. John opened the screen door for her. Tom Coleman suddenly appeared at the door with a shotgun. Coleman swore at them and told them to leave. John said, are you threatening us? Coleman brought up the gun and fired as John shoved Ruby out of the way. The force of the blast knocked John to the steps and he died instantly. Father Marsro grabbed Joyce's hand and turned to run. Another blast caught him in the back and he fell critically injured. Coleman put the gun down, walked to a payphone, called the police station and said, I just shot two preachers. Father Marsro was tended by a local doctor, then transferred to Baptist Hospital in Montgomery where he was operated on for 11 hours. He remained in the hospital a few weeks and then went home to East Chicago 
for a year of rehab. John's mother was having a birthday dinner with friends when news came over the television that two ministers had been shot in Alabama. John's body was taken to Montgomery while people tried to figure out how to get this body back to Keene. Air services from various terminals refused to fly the body for fear of reprisals. Finally, someone from Georgia donated a small plane and the body was flown to New Hampshire. A few days later, John's body lay in state at St. James Episcopal Church in Keene. More than a thousand people attended the funeral, including many from Alabama. In Hainville, the trial of Tom Coleman began less than six weeks after the shooting. Attorney General Richmond Flowers wanted to try Coleman for first degree murder. After some legal wrangling, Coleman was charged with manslaughter. A jury was seated. Interestingly, when Judge Thagard began qualifying the jurors, Tom Coleman's name was among those called to hear his own case. Someone whispered, you might as well strike him. The jury roll excluded residents under the age of 21, drunks, physically unfit, illiterates, except for property owners, and criminals. Also excluded judges, lawyers, physicians, dentists, teachers, and women. Makes you wonder who was left. <laughs> blacks could serve, but only 1% of blacks had ever been summoned, even though they constituted more than 70% of the county's population. No black had ever served on a criminal jury. Prosecutor Arthur Gamble declared they would prove Coleman shot and killed John Daniels on August 20th. And therefore, a guilty verdict was expected on the manslaughter charge. The Lowndes County Courthouse installed additional telephone lines so the major news organizations could handle all the stories. Representatives from the AP, the UP, the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, and local newspapers from around Alabama were on hand, along with major television news crews. During the trial, witnesses testified that John, Ruby, Joyce, and Father Morris Rowe walked up to the store. Some words were exchanged and Coleman shot John and Morris Rowe. Witnesses said John and Morris Rowe had a knife or other weapon. Other witnesses said no they didn't. One witness claimed John kissed Ruby Sales on the mouth. The suggestion of interracial familiarity horrified the white jurors and onlookers. Ruby Sales said there was no kiss but the defense had managed to interject that these northerners had publicly violated southern taboos and this egregious action might somehow justify Coleman's deadly act. Father Morris Rowe was recuperating in the hospital in Chicago and his statement was read during the trial. He said the only thing he had in his hand when he approached the cash store that day was a dime. The toxicologist who examined John's body took the stand, held up John's boots that he wore and said, what kind of preacher wears shoes like these? He painted a negative picture of John, thus ensuring it was John Daniels on trial instead of Tom Coleman. Three days later on Wednesday, the jury, jury reached a verdict after delivering one hour and about 30 minutes. The jury acquitted Tom Coleman on the grounds that his action in shooting John was self-defense. None of the trial escaped the nation's headlines, as you can imagine. 
But just in summary, from the Louisville Courier, here's Justice stabbed in the back. And this one about the wheels of justice in Alabama never getting started sort of sums it up. Tom Coleman still faced charges on shooting Father Morris Rowe, but nothing came of that. Coleman remained as a highway engineer in Lowndes County and lived to be in his 80s. He never wavered from his position. He said he'd done what he had to do. It would indeed be a sad ending to Jonathan's death if there were no legacy. But John's story does not end here. His hometown of Keene was the first to honor him with a yearly celebration of his life and service. And there are schools and buildings named for him. And about 20 years after John's death, Professor Charles Eagles stumbled across the story of the events in Hainville and began to research them. His work, Outside Agitator, is an excellent resource for information on the events. It's still in print. I drew heavily on that for this presentation. And what about the other people? I have updates on some. Father Marshrow left the priesthood after seven years. He married. He became an attorney. And he named his son Jonathan Daniels. He and his family live in East Chicago, Illinois, and he remains active in events having to do with honoring Jonathan. Ruby Sales attended the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge where Daniels attended. She's in uh, white here. She's a human rights advocate and deeply involved in projects that focus on social justice. She founded an inner city mission named for Jonathan and she lives in Atlanta now with her business associate Cheryl. Judith Upham completed seminary studies and became a priest when the Episcopal Church began ordaining women in the 1970s. She serves at St. Albans Episcopal in Arlington, Texas. Mrs. Alice West and her family live in Selma, very active in their community and their church. I visited her recently to talk about Jonathan and the time he spent living with her family and her continued interest in current events. She remains quite a lady. Fifteen years after Jonathan's death in 1980, Canterbury Cathedral created a chapel of saints and martyrs of our own time. The chapel honors people from all traditions of Christendom who sacrificed their lives for the faith. Among the 20th century martyrs listed are Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King, Jr. In 1991, Episcopal Bishop Robert Miller of Alabama joined with the Episcopal Bishop of New Hampshire to co-sponsor a resolution in the House of Bishops to add Jonathan's name to the Episcopal Church's calendar of lesser feasts. Here's Jonathan's page in the Book of Martyrs at Canterbury Cathedral. The Canterbury Cathedral Chapel provided these photos for me. The anniversary of Jonathan's arrest, August 14, is an annual church observance. People gather in Hainville, Alabama to honor him and the Alabama martyrs. There have been 15 named. The annual pilgrimage occurs in Hainville on a Saturday close to August 14th. There are prayers outside the courthouse, then a short walk to the jail. This past year, we were at, the jail was actually open and we could go in and, and look at the cells. Uh, a walk up to the cash store, which is about a half a block away, then back to the courthouse, which again is about a half a block away. And inside is a service that includes Holy Communion. This is the beautifully restored Lowndes County Courthouse. It's open for business each day. 
This is where the service is held to honor the martyrs. The judge's bench where justice was denied is now the bench where Holy Communion is celebrated. The cash store is occupied by a local business. There's a park outside the courthouse with a monument erected by Virginia Military Institute on the courthouse grounds. And other monuments have been erected around the country. Schools, scholarships, and awards have been named for John and now the pilgrimage to remind us of his faith and sacrifice. Important nationally, as a result of some of this turmoil, President Johnson signed the Federal Jury Selection and Service Act in 1968. This act prohibited discrimination of potential jurors because of their race and gender. This act had far-reaching effects in the cause of justice and does today. Notably, black and white women of Alabama could now serve on juries. I remember when I learned that I could, by law, serve on a jury. I'd not paid any attention to the fact that I was prohibited by law from serving on a jury. So it was indeed an eye-opening day for me in 1968. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, one of the most heroic Christian deeds of which I have heard in my entire ministry was performed by Jonathan Daniels. And as we begin this important 50th year of commemorating civil rights events, including the historic march from Selma to Montgomery, may we remember Jonathan and all those who stand for the cause of social justice. Thank you so much for attending and I've put a uh, list of my resources and references on the screen. And now you may have some questions. All right, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and then we do ask that you speak into the microphone so it's recorded. Surely there are questions. Thank you. Um, is, there, is there a gentleman? Okay. It, it's a powerful story. Uh, can you tell us how you became interested in it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, sometimes I hesitate to do that because, yes, it, you know, everybody's story is a very personal one, but I was living in Monroeville, Alabama when this happened. And in Monroeville, Alabama, as you probably are well aware, we were just besotted with uh, the story of To Kill a Mockingbird, Truman Capote, everything that was going on about the making of the movie, et cetera, et cetera. We were not all that much interested in something that was happening a hundred miles away. We just weren't. However, as an Episcopalian, uh, I had been aware that there were Episcopal priests and others coming to Selma to march, and uh, I just was more tuned in. I was also expecting a child, and uh, the day that Jonathan was murdered, I just remember my heart being flooded with emotion that here I was in Alabama expecting the birth of a child to be such a happy and glorious thing and yet here was a mother in New Hampshire that had lost her beloved son as a result of some heinous act and the story just stayed in in my heart and in my mind all these years and I wanted to uh, to do something special with it and I began working on a, a play, and I thought, well, for heaven's sakes, the play may never come to light, but there was so much information on that I had gathered, it just seemed a shame not to offer it to audiences such as yourself and to help us all remember what a beautiful story we have in this 
young man and these other people that happened just right here in our back door. So thank you for asking. The, yes, sir. The deputy, uh, Coleman, does he have a relationship between the Tommy, Thomas, uh, Thomas Tommy Coleman, former state trooper? I don't know. I, I don't know. There may be somebody here that knows more about uh, the aftermath of, of that family. And a lady here, yeah. Right here, actually right here. Oh, yes. I worked four full years in Lowndes County. Uh -huh. I'm an Episcopalian. I, I continue to try to help Lowndes County. I was talking with the Lowndes leader on Sunday who is very discouraged because the cash store was torn down this past year. Oh, it was? Okay. Yes. And um, she made comments about the divisions in the county. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what do we do to get beyond, in the good spirit of Jonathan Daniels, for peace and reconciliation in that county and beyond. I wish I had the answer. I don't have an answer. I know the uh, the, the people that own the store offered it to the Episcopal Diocese, and for some reason they chose not to to fund the saving of the store. So I, I didn't realize that it actually had been raised. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't. I, I think the the pilgrimage maybe helps, and I know there's a organization that's been trying to reach out each year when they have the annual pilgrimage. There's a, a beautiful reception held in the uh, interpretive center um, the Friday evening before the uh, march uh, around in the services on Saturday, and I feel like if more people would would be aware of that they might come and come to that reception and but I don't know I just I just don't have the answer yeah, yeah. Um, this lady had a question okay someone asked about uh, Tom Coleman and and the Coleman that you ask about is uh, Mr. Coleman's son I'm Fannie Davis and I'm the uh, coordinator for the, uh, for the Lowndes County pilgrimage that we do every year. And this year it will be held August the 15th, um, which is the closest date to, uh, to Jonathan's death. I do have some, some handouts if you want to see them. And we did try to purchase a cash store, but knowing that we wanted it, um, the price that they gave us was just prohibitive. And we had talked with them about, uh, about possibly getting the, the, the steps and the, and the uh, stones itself, but uh, we were unable to do that. He uh, did not let us know when they got ready to raise the building, so we weren't able to do that. And we will still be having the reception on that Friday night, August 14th, uh, at the Interpretive Center in Whitehall. So um, everybody's invited, and if you have more questions, then please, I'll be around for a little while, please ask. Yeah, this gentleman on the front row was actually in school with Jonathan, so. I'm Austin Fitz from Selma. I can, two bits of information that might be of interest to the group. Um, after Lowndes County elected its first black sheriff, John Hewitt, uh, former Deputy Tom Coleman let the sheriff know that he would be help him in any way that he could but not to tell anybody. Oh. <laughs> so that is a sign of progress of a sort. Um, and I think an example of Jonathan's impact in a totally different faith, Ruby Sales' brother had become a Muslim hmm. during this period. He's still a Muslim. He's, Joe Sales became Yusef Salam who later became the first Muslim ever elected to the Alabama State Legislature uh, from Selma. Uh, and he gives credit to Jonathan for his remaining um, the sort of Muslim that he is, who is bitterly opposed to Louis Farrakhan uh, and the hate mongers. Uh, having experienced hate mongers who are ostensibly Christian, he had no intention of becoming a hate monger of a Muslim. And gives Johnson some credit for that. Mm -hmm. And his sister, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, I'd just like to say that uh, I am an Episcopalian and I'm a member of the uh, of, of St. Paul's Episcopal Church and a bunch of us met with Jonathan uh, and when he was denied or thought he was denied communion and walking out a good many people walked out with, with him mm -hmm. and um, he was somebody that would probably not ever want him to be, to be uh, grandized in any way because he was a charming young man but uh, we uh, enjoyed meeting with him and, and like I said the, there were a good many people in our church that met with him and uh, Elna Falkenberry was the uh, wife of the Selma Times Journal person and uh, she was one of them and uh, we uh, we didn't run him out of our church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Any thought on what Jonathan Daniels might have done with the rest of his life if he'd have stayed in the ministry or uh, maybe done something else with his life? I thought about that. I think he would have stayed uh, an activist. I think he probably would have finished uh, his seminary studies and become a, a priest and I don't know whether we would have heard any more from him or not as it is you know he was he really I think would have been forgotten except the several years after his death the different ones in the Episcopal Church uh, in Birmingham particularly we're thinking about him and remembering him and, and figuring out a way to bring this, uh, his sacrifice to light. And I think through great amount of effort, they were able to do that. But uh, no, it's hard to know what, what he might have been uh, had he lived. But I know uh, you said you had covered the trial and uh, that was... Must have been a really interesting. What was was I pretty close to to events that happened, or did you see anything that maybe I was off on? Give me nine out of ten. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, history is what a person says it is, so I could only draw on what uh, I was told. So, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna say though that jail makes a black hole Calcutta. You know. <laughs> And, and we are trying to preserve that jail, too. We do have a new one. We don't longer house people in that jail. But I, I want to applaud St. Paul because I understand that in the spirit of reconciliation, they're having, on Palm Sunday, they're having a service with a, 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 an African-American church there uh, that I'm, I'm looking forward to attending on uh, Palm Sunday of this year. Glad to know that. Anybody? All right, if we don't have any other questions today, then if you would like to speak with Marianne, you are welcome to come up and speak after the, once we let out. But thank you all for attending, and thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.